I would like to welcome everyone. My name is Rosemary Laverde. I'm president of Crew Philadelphia. I'm also a partner at the law firm of Dilworth Paxton LLP. And I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Development in the Post-COVID-19 Environment. So with us today are Ed Klemek and Maeve Downen from KSS Architects, one of Crew Philadelphia's valued and longtime sponsors. So before we get started, I want to take a minute to share my screen. Hopefully I do this properly so that we can recognize all of our annual sponsors and we appreciate their support and we could not do what we do without them. So our premier lead sponsor, Bercadia, Skyscraper sponsors, Dilworth Paxson, Wispus Bank, Brandywine Realty Trust, White & Williams, First American Title Insurance Company, Capstan, KSS, Sonero, Herman Miller, Target Building Corp Construction. Our high-rise sponsors, Skanska, Spectrum, Fox Rothschild, NFI, J. Davis, O'Donnell and Nacarado, Brookfield Properties, Fidelity National and Chicago Title Insurance Company, Irwin and Layton, Archer, Clemens Construction Company, and Elliott Lewis. Our groundbreaker sponsors, Equus Capital Partners, Greyhawk, Hayworth, Land Services USA, NV5, Bach and Clark, and our affiliate sponsors, Advantage Sport and Fitness, Court, Interface, Rethink Innovations, and Trans American Office Furniture. So thank you to all of our sponsors. So I would now like to turn the program over to Mava, who will introduce she and, and Ed and get started with our program. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Rosemary, for that for the introduction. Um, I, just briefly about KSS, um, we are a firm that has multiple markets, commerce, learning, and community. Um, we established in 1983, and we currently have offices in Princeton, New York, and our largest office is in Philadelphia. Um, I'm a crew member, and so it's nice to see a lot of uh, familiar faces of folks that I've seen. makes doing these webinars a little bit easier um, <laughs> when there's some familiar faces in the room. So I'll, I'll be running us through uh, a discussion with Ed, um, and we would love to hear what you think. So please use the Q&A um, function, which you should be seeing at the bottom of your screen, to go ahead and submit questions. We will answer those questions. We're, we're going to leave time at the end for um, some Q&A and, and discussion. So we'll be answering those questions. But feel free to submit them at any time during the presentation. Um, so let me just go ahead and share here. All right, so what are we going to be talking about today? So we wanted to share some of our thoughts around emergent integrated development. Um, we already, as everybody knows, um, COVID-19 is having some impacts. And um, prior to the outbreak, we already saw that there were changes that were happening in commerce due to the exponential rise of e-commerce. Um, and the same was true with workplace. You know, there was already things that were happening in the 20th century saw the rise of the knowledge worker, the 21st century was already seeing a new type of distributed knowledge worker. So we wanna talk a little bit about how, what those trends were that were already in motion and how um, the industrial and office development can respond to those changes to bring the most value in the post COVID environment. So we'll be talking about um, industrial development as well as talking a little bit about why we should go back um, to the office. So we oftentimes have these moments of inflection, you know, where there are oftentimes major events that trigger lasting changes to, um, to the marketplace. And those are oftentimes positive changes. Um, the, this is a, a great example from history, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, an absolute tragedy. Um, a large number of uh, factory workers died um, as a result of this, and it was one of the largest and deadliest uh, industrial disasters in the history of New York City. Um, a majority of the uh, folks there who were working there were women, but um, the fire led to legislation that required improved factory safety standards and helped spur the formation of um, garment workers unions. So, you know, ultimately this has brought about some positive changes in that, in that industry. So when we look at what's happening today, um, we could say the coronavirus is, is a kind of fire of today. So 
we wanted to talk a little bit about what kind of um, impact the pandemic of today is going to have on industrial development. We already knew that commerce was changing um, due to the heavy, fast rise of e-commerce. A recent report by Prologis is now predicting that e-commerce will rise to 20% of total retail sales in 2020, and in just five years, um, will grow to 27% of all retail sales. Um, so there's there's definitely going to be there's definitely an acceleration there. So I would like to turn it over to Ed um, to give us you know talk a little bit about what do you what do you see happening there and give us maybe a little bit of historical perspective um, as to what's happening. Sure, um, and you know I think as you said, Mava, these are things that already had started to happen, and you know, really what we're seeing is this is an accelerant uh, to those things, um, and it goes to history. You know, you, you mentioned the Spirit Waste Fire; uh, it was a horrible tragedy. Um, the tragedy of it was that so many women died in in that factory. Many of them actually ha having to leap to their leap out windows and and fell to their deaths from the seven story window, uh, and and it was all because fire exits were closed because um, they didn't want people leaving, and that led to a lot of changes in, in regulation. As you said, on a positive note, especially for women, um, there actually was a witness to that fire who, who really changed her life and became a leader uh, in 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 labor. Um, her name was Frances Perkins. Um, she uh, actually uh, started immediately working for the governor's office af after seeing that and eventually became uh, secretary of, uh, of labor under Franklin Delano Roosevelt and uh, was the only woman who uh, actually was in the cabinet and the only cabinet member that was there for all of his terms. And that's frankly because he begged her to stay. And because of her and because of what she was inspired to do a lot of the things that we enjoy today, like the 40 hour work week, are because of what she witnessed and the change that happened. So there are points of inflection. Um, but what happened was those are changes that were already beginning. And of course, that tragedy accelerated. So what were the things that we're seeing now, too? That the first and I think probably wanted to start with the supply chain and I think industrial development, because this is where it just got registered first. Right. As everything was happening in China that's where everything stopped. And so we first felt the impacts of COVID from development uh, in industrial development in our distribution supply chain. Um, and so we, we thought we'd talk about that first because that was the first thing that we learned. Now, the interesting thing is that the map that you see on, in front of you, which is on, on the right-hand side, that actually was a map that KSS developed in 2013. And it was about a shift in the supply chain. Um, and at that point, what we had predicted was is that we were looking at um, the cost of, of, of energy, and then we were also looking at uh, carbon output. And at that point, we said that there would be a natural point of inflection, ready for this in 2020, where that would cause a shift, where no longer, no longer will we be a global supply chain, we would need to be more local in order to be resilient. And of, of course, we, who would have known about COVID? But I guess the greater point is that already that was in the motion. And it got to me too that understanding this because we are, because of the lack of sustainability in the supply chain and even the way that we develop and the way that we live, that we were going to encounter something, whether that's energy or whether it's something like COVID. And that's going to continue to happen because of the lack of sustainability. So first of all, we had already begun to see this shift that the real reality was is that when everything stopped in China, we began to realize how susceptible the supply chain was. So immediately people began to say, how do we change that? So what we began to learn pretty quickly was, for example, on medical supplies. Most medical supplies are actually coming out of China. That lack of ability to have supplies here was really problematic. The other thing that was happening is almost all production is happening in China. All of a sudden that began to stop and we began to realize that's problematic. So what emerged was this idea of what is the new K KPIs in the global supply chain. It's resilience, it's responsiveness, reconfigure, and how is it reconfigurable? And the logical extension to that is that it has to be more localized. Um, it still will be global. I mean, it still will be, have a global component from China, but it can't just rely on being global. It, was it is local networks that are more resilient. And the idea to not just local, but that they are more integrated. Already we've seen problems even in our local supply chain, where for example, in rural communities where there's large farming communities that were 
having to dump milk or having to destroy a lot of their crops. Why? Because they couldn't get them out. And yet at the same time, there are cities that weren't able to get what they needed. So it begins to suggest that what we're really looking at is more integrated development that includes the supply chain, which includes industrial development. So for example, development, like you see on the, on the left, which is classic, right, in the way it's zoned. Everything is segregated. You have industry over here, you have where people live over here, and all of those things are separated. That's not as resilient. The degree to which they become integrated into local trusting communities is the degree to which they can succeed. Now, what you see on the right is actually an image in New York City. Why didn't that succeed? It succeeded not necessarily because of problems with the supply chain, but the issue really was that it was too dense. So what we've learned out of this thing is principles of development, the idea of integration and the idea of density. And that leads to different ideas of how development ought work. Moreover, it also suggests that industrial development is not just going to simply include how we distribute goods that come from afar. It logically incorporates this idea that some goods will either, will probably be finished or componentized here, um, and that moreover, the kinds of things that happen in the creative communities that make for those environments is also gonna be a happening here and be integrated because that's what's gonna make it resilient. The other thing we began to learn is it's the local market that is trusted. And right now, trust matters a lot in the supply chain. So ironically, it came back to some ideas that we had developed some time before. The image that you see is of Brooklyn, by the way. And we had developed a, a very particular idea uh, for a redevelopment in, in Brooklyn some years ago, and that's the image that you see on the left. Now, what's interesting is, is this is not the, this is not the proposal that won the day, but it gets at, I think, what it was driving at. Um, so this is Sunset Development, it's in Brooklyn. If you know Brooklyn, it's very integrated. It has a long history of industry that is there. But what we're beginning, what we suggested was we should be working off of that and really begin to think about how industrial development, one, does have a distribution network. It's how goods get to the city. So the very base of this thing is envisioned as that. It's a place where things can come in from the port and things can be distributed out. But what's feeding them? And a tower that's up above. And we could see that as being a series of uses. It's last mile distribution. It's also production. To, it's also production oriented. And it has a storefront. This is also beginning to emerge in industrial development that as it becomes integrated, it isn't just for the storage and distributed of goods. It's actually where people can meet their goods. The classic example is Ikea, which my kids are now grown. I'm finally starting to get rid of all my Ikea. But we all go there to shop. And of course, it's still a distribution center. So the idea now that we're going to begin to see retail integrated with that as well. And if goods are going to be developed here, they, the creative force behind it also makes sense to happen here. So what we actually proposed in this is there were a lot of older industrial buildings, which are perfect creative environments. And this was an idea of redoing that. And then lastly, connecting it back into the streetscape of Brooklyn. So what would this idea yield? An integrated development where distribution, industry, creative workplace, and even community activities can begin to happen together. That creates a resilient environment. That's the environment that we think can, an example of the environment that we think can continue, particularly in industrial development. So moving forward, that's the kind of thing that we think can happen. Then you have to ask yourself, all right, if that's resilient and that works, where was the problem? The problem was density. Well, a lot of what we began, and all of us are beginning to see this already, is the idea that if we talk about that integration, it's really urbanization. That's what urbanization is all about. How you take a variety of different uses and you bring them together and you create a single living environment. What, although it can't centralize itself in just a few places anymore, we learn that's not sustainable as well. Already we're beginning to see this trend where tertiary cities are redeveloping, where there are living environments and working environments, and making environments, and distribution environments that are all beginning to happen together. So the idea is that that, what we, that model that we projected for Brooklyn might even be able to make its way across the United States. And when we have that degree of urbanization and integrated communities is how we think the new industry might live in, within environments themselves. So it's a different kind of development. It suggests that um, the places where we get our things and the places that we make our things in order to be resilient can't be apart from us. 
Now, on top of it, you know, maybe you, you were talking about too that this was all a trend that was already happening, right? So e-commerce was certainly already happening. Um, and if anyone doesn't believe e-commerce is happening, look outside your the door, the boxes that are probably piling up on your doorstep right now, right? My, my local post office has has a line out the door. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And you know that was what was going to make, you know, that's what's kept us alive. It kept us working. And all of a sudden now, I think we can begin to see how that really does integrate well into this overall. Uh, environment in which we live. It's what brought industry back. But you have to begin to ask yourself, does it really work? And what happens when our goods come to us that way and the places that bring those goods to us move even closer? What happens is kind of the thing that's on your screen. And what we began to see, and by the way, I really want to emphasize that this was already happening. This idea that the, our distribution centers, they're no longer just warehouses, right? These are places where goods are sorted, where they're compiled, where they're brought out to us. And it's no longer just five people working here. It's not unusual for one of these to have 3,000 people working here at a given time. So this is a new kind of a workplace. And it's where people need to live and work. And now we're beginning to see them. So what's happened? Now, first off, again, this is part of a, a long history. And actually, um, uh, from the Philadelphia Inquirer, Emily, I'm going to screw up her name, Gundelsberger uh, wrote a, a piece in this on, on the, uh, actually a series of pieces in the Philadelphia Inquirer, but also wrote a book around this called On the Clock, in which he described the experience of being, a, of working in this kind of a distribution facility. I'll just leave it like this. It's not good. You know, they, they have, uh, as an example, and the classic thing that, that she points out is when you walk into the space, they have bending machines full of pain relievers that are free. You have to ask yourself, why do I need to work in a place that has to give me free pain relievers? And that's just one example of it. There's a lot more examples of, of things that just don't work. And that's because we never really shifted from the idea of where we store our goods to how they're distributed and the people that are required to do it. Well, you move this back into, the, into our urban environments, we begin to care. And that's what's begun to happen. So first off, there already was beginning to be some discontent that was being raised. Next is, because it's in our cities, we're going to report on it. We're going to share about the things that are going on. And then during COVID, there's been a series of, of labor um, actions that have been taken, particularly within Staten Island. These are just, just a few of the headlines that have come out. And so clearly something needs to be done. If we're going to have this kind yeah. of a distribution environment, what's it going to be? And, and it really speaks to, you know, the, what you were just um, touching on there is that this kind of model of uh, distribution of goods means that a warehouse is not just a warehouse. It's really, it's a workplace, right? And the people who work in that environment, um, it's, this is a distribution center, it's a logistics hub. These are people who are well-trained, you know, who have um, who have uh, particular skill sets in order to be, to do those jobs. And, you know, as, as many, of, many of you may, you know, business owners may, you know, be, be able to connect, you know, people have value, right? Um, in order to run a build business well, you need to invest in people um, and treat them well. Um, this is just a, a slide um, with some data shared uh, from some of our clients um, that begins to give you a sense, you know, of where the cost are for somebody who's running this type of a facility. And you can see, you know, the salary benefits, 90% rent operations, energy, 10%, you know, that far and away, people are valuable and really necessary to making these distribution centers work and function and, you know, for us to get our, our Amazon package, you know, on time within one day or two days um, or same day. Um, and, and our clients have begun to, you know, to appreciate that. So, you know, the cost of a workout, the turnover is 25% of salary. When you begin to look at that across an operation, if you have a high rate of turnover, this is a big business cost. So, and I know this is something that, you know, you've certainly been thinking about um, and talking to our clients about that, you know, warehouses are workplaces. And so how do you make the wor workplace more humane? You know, what is it that our clients are starting to ask us for? Yeah, and you know, I think what you you talk about, Maeve, is that so that was data that we got from our clients, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and that was, we didn't. and I, I think that people just even a few years ago would not have thought of warehouses, right, as 
having a significant labor component in terms of cost. Well, first of all, they're not warehouses anymore. As you pointed out, there, there's something different. There are workplaces, a lot of people that work there. Um, and, and as a result, the costs are, are extraordinary for labor. I think there's another component to that, by the way, and some, they figured out that to retrain, you know, you, as you mentioned, these are sophisticated jobs. There's a lot of technology that's in place mm -hmm. in, in a distribution center. It takes a lot of training to get somebody to work there well. And so what they also found was, is that people were willing to leave. They were willing to leave for just a dollar more an hour. And that didn't make sense, you know, for the company economically um, because it cost, they figured out because of people moving, 25% of labor costs were just retraining. So it's an extraordinary cost. So you begin to ask yourself, well, why, you know, what keeps people there? How do I keep people there? And I think it goes across the board, you know, and, and maybe you mentioned about, you know, um, people work in offices and people work in distribution center. It, this is work. This is where people want to work. Why do right. people work and stay? Because they, because they belong because they have a sense of belonging and a sense of purpose that's there. So what we began to understand is you have to develop that back into the distribution center itself. The image that's in front of you, which we'll go through in a minute, is an image of a proposed inside of a distribution center, but it has all the components of the things that are going on. It's a pretty sophisticated workplace. And the degree to which you can design it so that people want to go there and stay there, you have something that A, responds to the business case that you just talked about, but also B, responds to what is the nature of the new development that's happening. If this is the new resilient model, that's the thing that we've got to work our way through. So mm -hmm. I'll give you a bit of history, as, as you've said already, this is all that we've done, we've accelerated the things that are already happening. So already this was beginning to happen. Let me take it through a couple of examples of how it was beginning to happen. So the first thing is, um, um, this is one of our projects. Uh, it's uh, in, in Bordentown, New Jersey. It's about 1.2 million feet, um, and this is we've done several ground-up buildings for uh, for Granger over over many many years. A great client. Um, they were, I think, one of the earlier adopters of the idea that they needed to focus on their workforce. Um, so the distribution center that we designed it is very different than the kind of things that we had been accustomed to. The image that you see in front of you is not the classic office entry area. That's a, that's the employee amenity space. What you're actually looking at is the cafe space and all around the cafe space are all the break spaces that they've built in as well because this is a tough physical job and they want to give people the ability to have a rest to get their heads out of it get out of the noise to be able to have a comfortable meal that's all the amenity space that's where they invested it um so and it has a connection to the and, outside and the as an example and the fact that you're even calling it an amenity space, right, that further kind of draws the parallel to workplace, right, which is, you know, something that we've certainly seen with office buildings to be competitive, right? You have to have a certain amount of amenities that people have kind of come to expect um, within their work environment. So it's interesting to see that there's kind of a parallel um, development within the industrial workplace. And, that, you know, 2,000 2, people work here. So um, mm -hmm. keeping them was really important. We even conditioned the building, by the way. Uh, a lot of times we condition distribution centers because of the goods. We do a lot of pharma as an example. You have to, because it's regulated. We conditioned this because of the people. And it really made it, it makes a huge difference in terms of, of their retainage. That's been the culture of Granger for a long time. So we learned an awful lot from that. Now, so but the idea was we wanted to find something that's tangible. We believe that there, uh, we know, that there is new regulation coming out concerning this. We know, as you saw by the data, that there is, uh, a, 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 we want, they want, companies want to be able to keep their people there. What is the credible way that we can build that? You can't just go, oh, I, because I built it and it looks nice, people will stay. No, we wanted to dig into something that actually would give us research to say, this actually supports the, that process. And so what we started, the idea of, of really supporting people and their wellness. So we turned to the well building standard as what had been developed by Delos um, and wanted to apply at least that framework of thinking to know that we have are working towards actual metrics that support people's physiology. And so these are the, these are the elements within the standard. By the way, just the previous image, um, it, this is not entirely without precedent. Um, so that, this actually was done by Prologis in the Netherlands. I should also say that there is a building right now going up in Piscataway uh, that Rockefeller is developing for Kuna and Nagel. 
that is also in the pursuit of a well standard, hasn't obtained it yet, but it's in the pursuit of it. Uh, and this one did obtain it. Um, it's very loose though. And we had actually developed the, the um, uh, we, we actually developed lead for distribution centers. And at one point they were the, you know, the square peg in the round hole. Mm -hmm. um, we couldn't figure out how to make energy work in a distribution center and lead work. Yeah. Well, right now it's kind of the square peg in the round hole, but we're getting there. And we believe that we can advance this, but just like lead, it is built on metrics. And when you build it on metrics, you can make it relate to the to regulation. You can make it say that I am supporting the well-being of my employees because I am doing this, 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 and that, and this is the information that backs it up. So this is the well-building standard and the kind of the, the elements I think that many on, probably on this call are familiar with. They've been used in the in office environment for quite some time. We wanted to figure out how to work this into the environment for the distribution center. So I'm gonna show you an example basically of how we did that. So, um, and this is, this is the repeat of the same image. I wanna get a, if anybody knows industrial development, this is a pretty typical industrial development. Well, mostly typical for the things that you're, that you're seeing. And so what are you seeing? You're looking at a, a lay down space. You're looking at a, a, a picking mezzanine that happens over on the left-hand side. You'll be familiar with all the stairs and all that stuff that you need to access it as well. You're probably already familiar with the kinds of lighting that's introduced. If you look just to the right of the slide, although I think it may have cut it off here, you'll see the clear story windows and whatnot that we've built into it. You'll see, for example, we have pump rooms and all that stuff. That's all the typical stuff that we're used to. What we did, and this is for a particular client, by the way, they adopted it a little bit. Um, and this is just one element. We actually went through and broke down a distribution center and how it works. Where is the picking happening? Where is sorting happening? Where is lay down space happening? Look at the human activities of work that happens in each of them and then designed a response to each of them that works to the elements that happen in well to say, how do we support them? So as an example, Emily in her book talks about the fact that people wouldn't take breaks because they had 15 minute breaks, but it takes them more than 15 minutes to walk to where they could have the break or you use the bathroom. So that was one low hanging fruit to break down. This is an example of that. So in this particular environment, what do we know? We know if you know picking and sorting, it's very loud. Um, you know it's probably remote from where the break area is. Um, it is, has limited engagement kind of with a natural environment. So what are the specific things, interventions that we did? We just simply built upon one of the egress locations. We introduced plumbing here. We introduced a space to take a break. We've introduced acoustic environments to get a break from the noise from all the machinery that happens. Location, where am I? If you go into a big distribution center, people want to ask, where am I? It's so easy to get lost. So hence the signage that tells you where you're at, that gives you a sense of location and where I belong. The use of more natural materials, the wood that surrounds it, as an example, um, is the idea of introducing some nature. If you would have looked over and to the right, you see a break area that actually is elevated and coordinated with the clear stories. No longer are they arbitrary, they're designed to give you a view out. And the last thing that we incorporated, for example, here, is the idea of the lighting is different. We're actually introducing circadian rhythm lighting into these elements. We recognize that people even work during the night shift need to begin to have those kinds of elements. So this is actually being implemented by, by a company as well. So all of what we did is we took down all of the particular functions that happen in the distribution center, broke them down this way, added design enhancements to them, tied them directly to the well, the well method, to create a framework to consider the entire distribution center. The intention is that this creates a workplace environment where people will want to stay and work in which they belong. That's the intention here. It makes sense economically. It makes sense in just in terms of, as you said, the humane aspect of, of work. And it makes sense in terms of the kinds of development that responds to a more integrated development where you see where your products are coming from. Mm -hmm. We believe that that's it, the kind of framework that's going to work in the future. Sorry. Yeah, and it and it speaks also to kind of an empathy, right? You know, correct, correct me if I'm wrong. We, you actually spent a night in in a warehouse also in yes, order to yes. <laughs> in order to develop this to really put yourself in those in those shoes. Um, so I, I'm kind of curious, you know, how how did that empathy or visualizing yourself in that space help help you think about uh, using these moments throughout? It helped a lot. Um, so yeah, you know, I've spent, trust me, many a day and even evenings in a warehouse, but always as an, as an architect trying to figure out how to, how to solve it. 
Mm -hmm. a few of us went in actually as a team and put on a different hat and that was to really be a worker there and it really opened up my eyes a lot to understanding what were the issues that were there um the noise as an example um the constancy of it when you're there for a, a long extended period of time boy does it make a difference orientation now, granted i'm an architect so I'm, i can figure out where i'm at pretty well it, you have no sense of orientation because there's no change in the color of the light as an example yeah. or differences in color within the space um so you lose that sense and with that you lose that sense of belonging we did also by the way spend a lot of time working with this company and actually taking surveys interviewing people and really built a long data list of things that we could work on to improve. So, you know, it's not arbitrary. It looks cool and it is cool. You know, that's, that's what we want to design, right? But on top of it, it really is a response to very significant issues as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that in the post COVID world, especially, this is the kind of industrial development that's going to happen. It's going to be in communities. It's going to be integrated. It's going to have to deal with all the infrastructure that you do in urban environments. It's going to have a different kind of a scale and they're going to be places to work. That's the new industrial development. Yeah. All right. So we've been talking a lot about the industrial development and, you know, how we really, because, you know, in large part of the rise of e-commerce that these um, facilities, uh, distribution centers have really become more than just large buildings right they become a new kind of workplace and kind of what right. the nature and role and position um within um the community they, they might begin to take um and you know we look at those we looked at that kind of workplace first um because the, the pace of that market has had to respond much more rapidly to some of the changes um that we're seeing um in the social political landscape um so we wanted to shift focus a little bit to talk about a different kind of worker um, and a different kind of workplace, um, and that is knowledge workers. And unlike somebody who's um, working for Amazon, you you know, which is a job you can't do from home, um, yes. this is a job that you can potentially, you know, many of us are doing that job from home, I hear in my guest bedrooms um, down my here. Porch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, we're all doing jobs in different places. So, so the changes, you know, the responses had, had to be a little bit more immediate um, in, that, in that typology. And, you know, there's some immediate responses that folks are seeing um, it, now in, the, in the, um, the knowledge workplace. You know, I think we've all seen the six foot office diagrams and some of the kind of immediate responses to how do we get back into the building. And we wanted to take a slightly different take on that um, discussion and talk about, you know, the why. Um, and so just as there were, you know, we were talking about the social, political, economic forces for the industrial workplace. Those are, you know, similar sorts of forces that have been operating within the knowledge workplace and have also similarly accelerated some trends and might be pushing us in some new directions. Um, so the 21st century distributed worker can be local and remote at the same time. And I think all of us are, are kind of experiencing that right now, right? That, you know, we all pivoted fairly quickly to being in a model where we, most of us were probably primarily in the office where FaceTime was very important. And we pivoted to doing um, a lot of remote work and that created, you know, new habits and expectations. Um, and, you know, we've also seen, so, you know, as we're settling into remote work, we're also seeing, you know, there are some of the major tech players like Facebook who have made some pretty bold statements about where they see the future of their workplace going um, and going to even more of, a, you know, going back to having more uh, or continuing to have more remote work. Um, and this is a little bit of a pendulum swing, right? Because remote work is not a new concept. Um, telecommuting as a term was first invented in 1973 um, in the midst of an OPEC oil embargo. And it was uh, Jack Niles was the, book, was the author of the telecommunications uh, transportation trade-off theory. And his theory was that congestion was really a communication problem. And that, you know, a lot of the congestion on the roadways, this was a little bit before I was born. Um, so I wasn't there to experience it, but a lot of the congestion lines Some of us were. Were. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us were. Many of us, I'm sure, on this call were. Um, congestion that, that was really related to the way that we have to be in person to communicate in offices. So if you can support a way of telecommuting, then can you take cars off of the road and alleviate some of that energy demand and alleviate 
you know, some of those other environmental impacts that come along with it. Um, so remote work is not a new idea. It didn't take off in 1973, um, and it had maybe some fits and starts. There was, a, you know, a big swing up about 10 years ago, but then, you know, a pretty famous retraction. Yahoo called in all of their remote employees and declared that it was a failure. Um, but so it's not a new idea. It's not, you know, the first time that we're doing it. Um, but some would argue that, you know, maybe the time is right. You know, maybe this time it's different. The technology is there. Um, and it's right for remote work to really have a substantial lasting place um, in the way that more businesses operate or to go to something like a blended model. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Ed. What's the business case? Why should we go back to work if we're, yeah, if we're that, all getting comfortable here? Yeah, exactly right. Uh, it's interesting, too, because you're, you, a couple of things. Um, one, uh, one is the same principle that happened in, in the industrial development that we're looking at in 2013. When you're, when you're no longer living in a sustainable world, these are the kinds of things that are going to happen, whether it was the OPEC crisis or whether it's COVID. Um, these are the kinds of things, and they're going to happen more the more we, the, uh, the more we unfortunately continue to live unsustainably. Uh, and then, right, it, this is, these are things that have happened before, and we've learned from them as well. Um, I think, too, that there was a lot of research done, too, ironically, to support um, what you were talking about, telecommuting, as it used to be called, I suppose. Uh, maybe it's now Zoom, Zoom commuting or who knows. Um, yeah, the, right. uh, <laughs> but um, it was to support why it would work. And what they did is they did research around why people work in office as well and how is it you could adapt those things to work in virtual environments. And if you flip it around, it teaches you why you should go back to the office. And I, we are beginning to think if we can answer that question, why you come back to the office, that you begin to answer um, something much more important. It tells us really the benefit of working together. And I think we're beginning to see that there are, as much as you may be right, that there may be a balance moving forward, that there's still gonna be a reason for us to be in environments together. And if that's the case, then what do those environments look like and how do they work? And one thing I can tell you is the image that's on the screen, that's not why I wanna go back to the office. I mean, it's not a place I think I wanna work. Surrounded by plexiglass and wearing masks all day. Yeah, we should wear masks and to protect one another for a while. But if that's all that we're doing, if all we are doing is adapting or fixing the old stuff to fit in this new environment, we've blown it. You know, we might as well stay at home. My instinct is, and what we're beginning to suggest, is that there are other reasons for us to come back. And just like an industrial, it's all started before us. If we can understand the history of that, we can understand where it is that we'll go. So we kind of did a, a quick analysis, really quick analysis of, of the evolution of the, the knowledge worker workplace that you, that, you, that you referenced. And it all basically happens just after the industrial revolution. So, you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there's this whole idea, you know, it's Henry Ford's production line. Henry Ford's production line mm -hmm. just doesn't happen in the, in the factory. It happens in the office too, right? Everyone has a function and you perform that function, whether it is the secretary who sits outside the office of the engineer who is doing their thing to produce some information to create the car and everybody worked in their own chunk, their own cubicle, whether it was literally a cubicle, like in the, like in the image that you see behind this, or whether it was an office, they did their individual thing and they reported back to the big boardroom. And you know what? That's exactly how the office place was set up. But guess what? And it was all geared around productivity. How can I get this group of people to make and do more things? The only problem right. was it didn't work. And and it was and it was a model that also you know to kind of talk about the blends back and forth right it grew out of a factory right yeah, exactly so it grew out of an industrial right right it was the same thing exactly correct yeah. so then they moved on and say you know what people don't, don't really do that um in order for people to be productive they actually have to work together it's an interesting too and we'll talk about creativity in a minute it, it people think it's an individual thing it's not it's a communal thing it's a social thing People began to realize that people working together produced more than people working apart. So the office redesigned itself. So what did we do? We wound up making the places, well, part of this is real estate too, making the place where we individually work smaller. That's when Gilbert came to be in his, in his cubicle. Uh, and then we needed to have other places to collaborate, not just the boardroom, right? So we needed to accommodate where people could work together. So they created collaboration zones. 
smaller meeting rooms and things like that, war rooms where people could work together. But it was still focused on productivity. How much can I get, can get this group of people to produce? And to a certain extent, it began to work, but it actually was working for different reasons than people thought. And that's when the next kind of evolution happens in the workplace, is that it no longer, people began to realize that people were actually not just producing more, it what became more important is when they were innovating, when they were creating something new, and there was more value out of the output of people, not when they did more, but when they did better. And when they started to create new things, hence innovation. I mean, it was the buzzword that lived for a long time before all this COVID stuff, right? So what we began to look at the processes of innovation and say, how does innovation work? And what we began to realize is, is that when you encounter different things, new things, unexpected things, people that you run into, uh, different kinds of environments, when there's choice in where I work, because one day I have to think like this and another day I have to work like that. When I begin to introduce those variables, something else happened other than productivity. Innovation began to happen. And innovation began to have more value than productivity. So that's where we kind of left the, the workplace before all this happened. We started to create environments like the image that you see is sort of layered in behind this, right? So they were comfortable places to be, individual work desks. They were different kind of collaborative environments, different kinds of pinup spaces, different kinds of meeting rooms, all that stuff and places to eat and to drink and to stay and to be social. All of those things fostered this idea of innovation. So now, now that we all can't hang out together, what do we do? <laughs> so this is pretty interesting. There's been a lot of research that has suggested that the real answer to something like COVID or unsustainable environments is this idea of trust. And that what you really want to be able to do is to work with people you trust and that you value being with. So, you know, why do people trust one another? Well, they, they trust one another because one, we all recognize that we're, we're all competent in what we do and we can see that, right? I could, you and I work together all the time, Ava. I see how you work. You see how I work. We trust one another because of the work that we do together. And I know you're really good at what you do and Hopefully you say the same thing about me. And that allows us to stay together and work. That builds trust. The other thing that builds trust is relationship, is interpersonal relationships. And what's really interesting about this is the, uh, the new phrase started to emerge and that's cohort. So cohort becomes the idea of why people work together. It's a creative community that works together. It's a trusting community that is built around the um, people working together. If we could design around a cohort, we probably can design for why people come back. And why do people come back? And I've just experienced this, by the way. We finally had to have a meeting around a project that we were doing, and we got 12 of us in a room. We're all masks, we're all spread apart. What we got accomplished in two hours was far more and far better than we could ever do in a Zoom meeting. It made why mm -hmm. we were working creatively together. So creative cohesion becomes the reason why we come and do that. And there's a model of that. And it, uh, learning commerce and community, as Mavis said, right from the very beginning is where we work. The thing about it is we learn from those things. So what are the environments? We think it's actually model. Of, if I may ask Mavis, if you just go back to the previous image, just for, the, yep, just yep. for a moment, thank you. So the image that's behind it, by the way, is active, actually an active learning uh, environment that we have created in a college and university setting. We're doing this a lot. Another thing, trend to pay attention to, as people want to work, in places that are like where they learned. So many times, for mm -hmm. example, in innovation in lab centers, we're bringing new PhDs who are working back into those environments and they're saying, well, that's what I liked about that. This is where people are learning. What's interesting is look at the image. Two people are spread apart sufficiently. They're six feet apart. They're working individually, but yet they're working together fluidly. There is no barrier between those things at all. And there's another thing that there can't be a barrier with between the virtual world and the physical world. You know, if, as you said, Mava, if it's 50-50, if some amount of people are working at home, there can be no hierarchical difference between the people who are working at home and the people who are in the office, right? People may be home because they have kids. We were talking about this earlier. I'm in a good place. My kids have moved on. Your kids haven't done that yet, right? Those are the reasons why some of us need to work at home. There can be no difference in that. 
And so the, the degree to which we blend those virtual and the virtual and the physical environments so that the level of friction between them is gone is the degree to which we create creatively cohesive environments built around the idea of a cohort. That's why you come back. That's the image that you see behind you. And we think you can scale this too. It just doesn't, isn't just this one room. It can happen in all kinds of workplace environments. And to the point of this has been happening, guys, all along. That's the next image. Thanks, Mava. Yep. I am around too much around some of the other things. Forgive me. Um, so this is the stuff that we were doing. This is a space that we did for BioVid. If you think about what we just talked about, the creative cohort and why people come together, that's it. They want to work creatively together instantaneously, fluidly, back and forth from the work environment that you see behind them into the creative space that's here where they can begin to share ideas. And the densities aren't the same densities. Why? We've traded off on our individual workplace in order to have better shared spaces. So the densities are different. The next image probably demonstrates that even, even the most. But this mm -hmm. is the same environment, by the way. So look, again, my individual workplace is really tiny. But look what begins to happen. I get to spread people mm -hmm. out. I get to introduce all of these other places and look at the conference room. It's the place where I can fluidly move into to create together that has sufficient density or lack thereof in order to accommodate people in the new environment and allow them to work creatively. Now, right now, unfortunately, the best interface with the technology we have, at least in the corporate environment, is the kind of thing you see in the left-hand side of that conference room, right? That's gonna also change dramatically. And it could probably go back right. to some of the active learning classrooms that we're starting to work on together, where they're a lot, lot more fluid than what we're incorporating. Right, and, and, you know, similar, you know, you can learn things, I think, from other, from other typologies, and certainly those kind of higher ed environments, you know, have a lot to offer in terms of thinking about kind of a blended model of being in person, as well as, you know, where you're doing some work um, as a team, um, and some work autonomously that can be even asynchronous that can give you maybe a little bit exactly. more, you know, flexibility. And and I think that, you know, the I, I think we've all kind of, you know, the technology is maybe, you know, if I were to maybe say it's not quite, you know, there, I think we've all kind of experienced it, this phenomenon of Zoom fatigue, right? And there's a lot of interesting studies that, that I point to, you know, some of the real measurable reasons why you know you might be feeling that and and you know it, it relates to kind of our biology that we as humans evolved to be very social we evolved a lot of sophisticated ways to communicate um, that rely upon in-person cues and when there's just a little bit of a lag between the speech that you are hearing versus the way somebody's you know is talking if there's a lack of a difficulty making eye contact those things can you know add to your mental processing so i think you know that's maybe you know maybe if the technology gets to the point that you can kind of overcome some of those um difficulties then maybe we won't need to be in person <laughs> but but i suspect that that 12 person meeting you know maybe it was so productive because you guys had all of those kinds of cues for communication that happens you know non-verbally but when they're together absolutely so you know and and that's it all right that that was the image we talked about that we brought in from the learning the learning environments the that we created the active learning environments and I, like i said where people learn tends to be how they want to work i think this is the kind of model that you're going to see moving forward so it goes then to the bigger question of, that we're really trying to answer in this right what happens to commercial real estate what happens to you know should, should we be terrified we're never going to develop another office building again because everybody's going to hang out because they love zoom so much no, there. Um, and what's going to happen in industrial development, right? Is it, you know, is it all done now? What's going to happen with it? Well, clearly, right off the bat, we knew we needed new industrial development. We needed to work it differently, right? Um, I think we know the same about office environments. I'm very convinced that when we learn these things, when we learn the new ways in which we work and want to work, that's how we can create value in commercial development. And that's going to create the future, not necessarily need more of the same thing. It's different things that support different kinds of distribution, different kinds, a different kind of resilient supply chain and a different way of working. COVID-19 just simply accelerated all the things that were already happening. So what I come down to, um, and maybe and I were actually kidding about this in a <laughs> get around. Please, everyone, don't do this this weekend. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> this is way too close, right? Um, but maybe, maybe it's a hopeful.
because you know I'm, I'm all, we're all hopeful that this will end and we will have a vaccine and we'll be able to be like this again soon. But the reality is, is that we will always come back together. We will have learned from all this. And what will bring us back together is that idea of a cohort, that we are communities of people who share values, who trust one another. And the degree to which we can create development that is truly integrated, that works across the nation, not just in central locations, but across the nation, that integrates how we get our things, to how we make our things, to how we think about them, to how we design them, to how we create them, to where we live and to where we learn and to where we work. When all of those things really come together, we create trusted communities, communities of values. And it goes to more than COVID-19. If you think about all the things that are going on, I think in the world out there today, the degree to which we build integrated trusting communities through our commercial development is the degree to which we are going to support a better world that moves forward and have learned from the world that we face today. And I think, you know, that's the kind of overall positive but realistic note that I would hope to leave everybody with. So with that, I think right. we'll take Q&A. Yeah, so we try to be have a few minutes left. We would love to hear, you know, what, what folks are, their reactions and um, yeah, what, if there's any questions from the audience or comments about what we've just presented. Yeah. I don't know if I'm not seeing, um, well, I, I have a few questions. Um, uh -oh. if, if, uh, <laughs> if, you, if you feel like being a betting man, um, if you were to uh, be placing some bets, um, how heavily would you be betting, or maybe I should ask this slightly differently, what kind of office space would you be betting on right now? Yeah, office space. So um, I think it's a kind of open environments that have a lot of collaboration and are, have a big infrastructure in them for for all the visual stuff that we need to do. Um, I, I, and I also think more spread out. And we're all beginning to see this, right? Tertiary cities or even in the suburbs where we're beginning to create new kinds of office environments that's, that are more akin to what we had in bigger cities that are happening there as well. I, I think it's a big place for that. So collaboration, infrastructure, and, and diverse. Mm -hmm. And what about, um, and if you were betting on uh, what, what would you be betting on with the future for retail and, and mall spaces? I think that's been something that has been, you know, a big point of discussion about the rise of e-commerce and, you know, our, if, you know, pa patterns of behavior continue to accelerate that Prologis report is, you know, pretty startling, right? 27% of commerce in five years being online. I still think that people want to interface with the goods that they buy. Um, and I think there's a place for that. But I think that we've created this model where we'll interface with the goods we buy, but we don't necessarily have to bring it home with us, right? And we know that I can see a little bit of this and I can purport that into something larger. So in terms of mall redevelopment, it's a big question how to, what, what to do with it. There will be a place for retail that is in addition to e-commerce. We did this around food recently, and you may, may remember this. There's a real trusting relationship that you build when I buy food and I see it. I don't have to buy, once I build that trusting relationship, then e-commerce works. So, but mm -hmm. that is gonna have to happen through a portal like retail. Yeah, all right. We do have a question here from Susan Jansen. Um, what types of companies do you foresee taking these steps first, getting back to the office in this way? Creative companies, um, and we're seeing it, right? Yeah. We wanna be together because Knowledge. we create together. Yeah. Yeah, and I, creative companies aren't just architects. Um, we're all, it's also, um, I'm working with right now with a research company. Um, does a lot of early, early research. They want to be together in a bad way because of that. They want to collaborate in that, that way that makes for no friction. Mm -hmm. All right, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, maybe maybe there are some questions in the Q&A. I don't know if you can see them, so um, I'll read. Uh, what Thank kind you. of materials are most important right now? What kinds of materials? Materials. Uh, in terms of uh, construction materials? Um, yeah. 
Um, construction materials right now, I will tell you that um, we are going crazy with develop, redevelopment right now in urban areas around industrial. Uh, Steel is going to be a problem again, believe it or not. And so is concrete panels and all that stuff. So um, it's happening fast. So there is beginning to be a, a shorter supply of materials. All right. So one, one more question here about as we move forward to reopen offices while still dealing with COVID, what are the reasons to motivate employees to come back to offices? Can designers collaborate from six feet? I think you maybe are, are in the midst of thinking about this also. Uh, yes, as a business for our company. <laughs> yeah, so the first thing is, yeah. is you ask your employees, right? Find out why they want to come back. Um, you'll get to the bottom of that pretty quick. And I think that what you're going to see is that there, we, there are bracketed reasons that we have a lot of younger people who are just completely on their own and they yearn for that social connection. Even if it's just to see somebody from across the way, that's really important. So that's the first group of people. Ironically, our New York office, although it's the craziest place to be, they're the ones that want to go back the first. Next is um, people who um, I, I think want to collaborate in creatively the way that we've been talking about. Uh, and then finally might be those people are looking to reestablish balance, right? It's too much, so many people are trying to teach their kids, raise their kids and work all at the same time in the same place. I'm seeing a little bit of burn around, burnout around that. So ironically, you go back to the office to also create balance in life. So why? It's why we live, it's why we work. Answer those questions and that's what drives you back. And what's really important is ask people, ask people those questions. It ain't about productivity. That's certainly something we already learned about. So we are just at one hour here. So um, this has been fun, Ed. Uh, it's been a good, been a fun uh, conversation to have. Um, I turn it back to Rosemary. Is there anything you would you would like to close us out with here? I just I just wanted to thank Ed and Mava for this presentation today. I think we've all learned a lot, and I, and some people will have said that in the chats. So I know we had um, our Q&A, but there are also some chats praising all your pictures. So <laughs> I thank you everyone and uh, have a great day and a great 4th of July. See you thank soon. you all. all Be right. safe. Well, thanks, thanks for spending, spending an hour with us, everybody. We appreciate hearing your thoughts. We really appreciate you giving, taking your time to uh, share your knowledge with us as well. Thank Take you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.